Well, greetings. I'm so glad you guys are joining us today, and I hope that uh, everything is going well. Just know that we are praying that uh, as, we, as we continue through the, this season of, of uh, our history, I guess we'd call it, uh, you know, we know that for some of you it's still just not the right time to, to come and join us again uh, for church. And so I just want, to know, want you to know we, we're thinking of you, and we care, and we're praying. And if you need anything, if you need us to be praying for something, something's going on in your life, or you just, you just need somebody outside of your house to talk to, uh, call the church, okay? Give us a call. Send us a message through uh, Messenger or something, all right? Uh, hey, why don't we take a moment and let's just pray that, that God would talk to us through his word as we, as we begin today, all right? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I want to invite you in right now and ask that you would come and sit with us. You would help us to hear what you are saying and that we would recognize your voice, that, that as we look at your word and as we kind of let it sink in, that, um, or that you, would, you would help us to, to see what it is we're supposed to take from, from your message to, to your disciples. Help us to see ourselves accurately and help us to see you accurately as we, as we study your word. We thank you so much for the gift that you've given us of Scripture. And uh, help us to treat it as that, a gift. Lord, open our eyes and open our ears to your voice. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me begin by just a quick review. Uh, Two weeks ago, we were looking at this passage found in Luke chapter 6, and uh, once again, Jesus was uh, up on the mountainside, he had, he had prayed all night, and then he, had, he selected his apostles. Then he came down onto a, a level spot, and he began um, to heal people. And, and in the midst of this healing, he turns to his disciples, and he begins to teach them. And he, and he says, blessed are you who are poor, and blessed are you who are, uh, who are hungry, and blessed are you who, who, who weep, and blessed are you who, when you're picked on, or you're, you're hated, or you're rejected for my name. And then he said, woe to you who are, who are rich, woe to you who are well fed, and he continues on. Last week we looked at this passage and he says to his, his disciples to love your enemies. And the challenge I had when I read that is, is that what sunk in for me was is my enemies, love my enemies. And, and I realized, and, and I'm not proud of this statement, but what I realized is, is I struggle to love those I love. I mean, if I look at the definition of love like in, in 1 Corinthians 13, and I find that I fall short pretty significantly, that uh, I struggle to love like that with those that I say that I love or those that I actually really do love. And so Jesus ups the level a bit and he calls us to love our enemies. What a challenge. And then he goes on and he, and he gives us the, the golden rule, as we call it. And uh, the golden rule is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the, the thing I talked about with that was is, um, you know, it's, we think we've got that, but we tend to live it out or we tend to read into it more of like a negative, like uh, don't do what, what you don't want other people to do to you. And, and uh, if we will stop and let that sink in, that we are to do what we want others to do to us, that's a pretty significant difference between the not doing and the doing. And so it's a real challenge to see our lives that way. And then and then what I said was, what if the this picture that or that what Jesus is the words Jesus uses here, what if this is a picture that Jesus is using to paint us an image of God? And and as we look at that picture, what we begin to see is 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 this that I believe God treats us the way he wants us to treat him. So he practices the golden rule, the, 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 the grace that he gives us and the forgiveness that he gives us and the patience that he has for us. Man, you know what? He deserves, he deserves all of that. And it's, in fact, it's a little bit crazy almost to think that, that, um, that God would want us to be patient with him. I mean, he's God, right? Except for, quite honestly, a lot of times we... We judge God. Um, we have lack of patience for Him, for His timing. And, and maybe we begin to look at the golden rule is, is that God is treating us the way that He wants us to treat Him. 
It's a total challenge and looks a little bit different, all right? That, that's kind of the review. That's what we, were looked at, what we looked at a couple weeks ago. And so today, you know, as I, as I sat down to work on this, we're going to do something just a little bit different. Now, um, what I've given in, uh, um, online would be the notes for, for my sermon. And, and on that is, is, is our passage, Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 27 through 38. And so uh, I would challenge you, what we're going to do in just a moment is, is we're going to... I'm going, to, I'm going to just tell you in, in, in a story form almost the, what Jesus says to his disciples. And, and as I do, I want you to just kind of follow along and, and see, is there anything that I miss? Is there anything? Um, <clears throat> but, but just listen. And after we listen, I want, you to, I, want to, I want you then to look at the story that is written down, okay? And I want us to look at, at what, uh, uh, what I've said and see if I missed anything. Um, anything that maybe stands out to you a little bit differently after you've heard the story. So, uh, you know, as I prepared, you know, the, the thing that's been happening, I didn't preach last week, Trevor preached, and if you tried to watch that video, I just want to apologize. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. I don't know why the sound wouldn't work, but all you would have gotten was um, 40 minutes of watching Trevor with no sound. And I'm not sure anybody wanted to do that, so we didn't post it, all right? Sorry about that. Hopefully, um, we won't have that problem again. But uh, um, anyhow, within the last week and a half, uh, two weeks, you know, we have watched our country just begin to, to disintegrate a little bit more. And, and I, I, we watched the current events, and I don't know how much you watch current events, but uh, I don't, it has been a pretty discouraging thing for me. And, and I've watched it, and, I, and, I've, and I've watched the rioters and the looters and the focus on the, um, the racism that we see in, in our country. And um, I've had some emotions. I don't know if you have, but I've had some frustration. I've had some hurt. I've had some sadness. And I've had some anger. Uh, and, and so as I approached this passage this time, it stirred some different emotions in me, or maybe it um, amplified some of the emotions that I would, would normally feel. And so what I want you to do, as I tell this story, just don't, don't read the words along with me. I just want you to listen, okay? And I, and, and I want you to kind of think about what emotion does this stir in me, okay? So be, be acknowledging kind of what's going on as you hear the story, all right? So Jesus had been, um, had just had an amazing time with God, spent all night with him conversing, and, and from there he, he comes and he, and he encounters his disciples, and he's got a crowd around him. And as he, as, he, as he spends a little bit of time with his disciples, he begins to pick from the crowd. And he, he, what he does when he picks from this crowd is, is he is selecting them as his apostles. Now, apostle means sent one. And so what he's doing is, is he's beginning to prepare uh, for what's, going, what's coming. And what he's beginning to say is, is listen, I, from this point on, you're no longer just a disciple, just a student of mine. From this point forward, what you will be is the one I send. You will be my ambassador. You will be my representative, and, which is a significant difference. And from there, he goes, and he goes to the crowd. Now, I don't know what the apostles thought when they watched this because they had just been selected by him out of this crowd of people to be the 12 apostles. I would imagine those guys probably felt pretty special, maybe a little scared, a little intimidated, but... But I think they were probably feeling like, man, this is, this is awesome. I'm in the inner circle. And they watch Jesus as he goes down to the crowd, and he stands on a level place. And as he's there, the crowd just kind of engulfs him, and he begins to heal people. And, and it, the Scripture tells us that uh, uh, people with evil spirits were being f- f- set free and and that, that anybody that was there was being healed. Everybody was being healed. And people were trying to just reach out and touch him. And so as this is happening around him, Jesus looks at his disciples. As this crowd is going on around him, he looks at his disciples, not just the apostles, but he looks at his disciples and he begins to teach them. And as he goes, he eventually gets to this place and he says, 
But to you who are listening. Now, it's almost as though he transitions from, from one point to this next point, And he says, but to you who are listening. And we, we covered that several weeks ago. But to you who are listening. And he says, love your enemies. He says, do good to those who hate you. He says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, that give to them the other. Turn, turn your other cheek. He says, if, if, um, if somebody wants your coat, don't just give them your coat. Offer them your shirt as well. He talks about generosity and he says, Give without the expectation of repayment. Don't expect or don't demand that, it, that you get it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you, he says. And then he goes to them and he says, what credit is it to you if you were to love those who love you? He says, even sinners do that. What credit is that to you if you do good to those who do good to you? Because that's, I mean, that's what sinners do. Even the worst of the worst do that. What good is it to you to lend to somebody and expect them to pay you? In fact, expect you to expect to get your money back plus interest. What good is that? What credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. He says, but I want you to love your enemies. I want you to do good to those who hate you. I want you to lend freely. And then he speaks about reward. He says, your reward, if you do these things, your reward will be great. And you will become children of the Most High. And he begins to describe God a little bit more. And he says that the God is, is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful. God is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful. And, and so, therefore, we need to be merciful. We need to not judge or we will be judged. We need to not condemn or we will be condemned. We need to forgive and how we forgive will be how we're forgiven. It says, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, will be given to you. And then he ends with this statement. With the measure you use is the measure that will be shown to you. Now, as we finish that, I want to, I just want to, let's rebuild it for a moment, okay? And one of the things that, like I said, is I want you to just kind of jot down an emotion. I'll tell you my emotion. The emotion I had as I did that, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to rush you. Uh, I don't want you to focus on my response. I want you to be able to write, write your emotion down. But the emotion that I felt is this. The only way I probably can describe it is, ugh. I mean, e even in the light of current events, as I, as I picture the looters, as I picture the protesters, and I think, oh, this is a hard teaching. Almost, maybe the word impossible comes to mind. And inside of me, there's these thoughts of, yeah, but... I don't want to be an enabler, right? How, where does, where does um, holding people accountable fit in? And so I, it creates this, there's this, this question in me of, yeah, but. But as I rebuild it, what I begin to see is there's a pattern to Jesus' lesson here. He states what, he, what he's calling us to. And then he points out to us how we think so that we maybe will see the flaw in the, our thought process. And he moves from that, pointing out the, thought, the flaw in our thought process, to restating it, and as he restates it, he, he pulls in this picture of who God is. 
And then he talks about the result. What, what will come of it? Now, with that, let's, let me read this to you. You're going to hear it again. But as I read it, I want you to think, did I miss anything or did something, else, something stand out different than the first time, okay? So it says this, but to you who are listening, this is what I say. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. All right, so as we look through that, there's a couple things that I want us to take note of, but I just want you to take a moment. And if there was anything you underlined or you said, oh man, that's, I didn't notice that before. Oh, did he leave that out? Maybe, just maybe that's, that's Jesus saying, hey, I want you to see this. Maybe that's the place that you need to look at, Okay. But the things that I, I noticed that we're going to talk about today is this. The first one is, is did you notice that, that Jesus says, even sinners, he says that three times. Now, repetition makes me, um, makes me pause for a moment. If he repeats something, maybe, just maybe, we need to recognize this, right? And so as I think about that even sinners, what I begin to recognize is, is huh, that statement all of a sudden makes the statement judge and condemn stand out to me. Because when I read the word sinners, what I begin to think of is, is who? I mean, I begin to kind of have a face or a name or a kind of person in mind. And so as I look at that, what I begin to say is, is ah, wait a minute here. Who am I, who am I looking at? To measure my behavior. I mean, do, do you hear what he's talking about here? Even sinners do that. So this is what we do. Well, I mean, you know, it's okay. This is how I, I mean, it's all right. I'm justified in this action. Look, the, the law says it's okay for me to do that. Therefore, it's the right thing to do. Um, I'm basing my behavior on how the world responds. See, we tend to measure ourselves against others, and we decide where we, at, where we fit based on that. Now, for example, as I've watched the current events, there's this thought that I'm actually, I'm a little bit hesitant to share with you, and I don't know, I don't know, you know, because it's going to be on on the internet, and I think, oh man, if somebody sees this, I don't know what they're going to be thinking, but, but there's this thought that I've had as I've watched kind of the 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 rioting and the demonstrations and, or the protests and, and, and the looting. And, and I thought to myself, man, I, I, I think I'm about as wide as they come. But I am not racist. I mean, that's the thought that I've had, right? Based on, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm racist. And as I've watched what, and I've listened to what has been said, I've thought, I'm not, that's not me. I'm not, just because I'm white doesn't mean I'm, doesn't mean I'm racist. Now, let me just confess something to you. Um, 
I have not been exposed to a lot of diversity ethnically, okay? Uh, I live in a community that is pretty white, and it's hard for me to actually know if I'm racist or not because if somebody of a different ethnicity shows up in town, most of the time we notice. You might be driving down the street, and they're, if they're walking along the sidewalk, you go, oh, who's that? I've never noticed them before. But as, I rec- as, I, as I'm thinking through this and I'm processing, I could have some opinions that make me sound racist. And yet I watch the news and I think, but I'm not racist. But when we use the word they or the term they in regards to another ethnicity, well, that's a, that's a red flag for racists. Now, it doesn't mean that we're racist, but it is a red flag. In fact, I've, I've heard it used. And I've actually had this thought, and this is where maybe I do sound a little racist, okay? But I've also thought, well, you're just as racist. I mean, you look at me because I'm white. I'm getting lumped in with all the other white people. See, what happens is, my argument inside of my head, well, you're just as racist as I am. Now, what I've just done is I have tried to measure my behavior based on their behavior. See what, see what, see what we do? I mean, you're more racist than I am. Or you're just as racist as I am. I've just measured against somebody else. See, we judge ourselves based on what we have seen in others. See, and when we do that, hidden within that is judgment. Hidden within that is condemnation. So what the question, I guess, is, as we look at that, is what image do you have when you read even sinners? Well, for some of us, I know your response is, well, you know, that's me. I'm just a sinner. Sinner saved by grace. I want to challenge that statement. I get it. I understand why we use that statement, but, but I want to be cautious about that statement. Because I think sometimes it's, a, it's false humility. Sometimes it's a politically correct answer. And we might argue, well, we're all sinners, right? And yet, I'm not sure that's what Scripture says. See, when Jesus talks to his his disciples here, he is distinguishing between them and sinners. There's a big difference here. And he's not just talking about the worst of the worst. What he's talking about is, is, hey, my disciples, I am not calling you sinners. We'll get to that in a moment, okay? So even sinners, that statement creates a picture in, in my mind. I mean, I, when he says the word sinner, even sinners, I, there's this picture in my mind. I'm not the one that goes, oh yeah, well, we're all sinners. I mean, that thought goes in my head a little bit, but, but really what happens is it creates a picture in my mind of people I know who are kind of rough and, and, and don't have any interest in God. And what I recognize is, is all of a sudden, we use these people as a basis to feel better about ourselves. And Jesus uses that to show us, stop patting yourself on the back for thinking your behavior is okay because everybody does it. Because because it's socially acceptable. Don't pat yourself on the back to say, man, I, you know, it's okay. It, my behavior's all right. Because socially, that's the, that's the behavior that, that our society says is okay. What we should be going is, is, wow, I act like them. That's not okay. And I've been thinking that's okay.
if the world thinks it's acceptable, then if I do it, it's acceptable. And that's, that's, the, that's the absolute wrong thing to think. Jesus is calling to us to be to something different. When I let that sink in, what I hear him say to me is, I need you to see this as an identity issue. Well, wait a minute. I don't know how we kind of got there, honestly, even sinners, right? But all of a sudden, it's, it, it comes into focus. If I be, can begin to see this as an identity issue. See, when my identity is wrapped up in this world, I have a thought process that needs corrected. If we are saved by grace, that means we are being transformed. It doesn't mean that, that he just forgave us our sins. I don't want to say just, but it doesn't mean that he forgave us our sins and that's as far as it went. Saved by grace is, means that he is at work doing something. We are going from one thing to something else. We are being changed from sinner to something. This is a critical piece we, I really believe we have to understand here. So once again, it's an identity issue. So number two, the thing I notice is, is we are moving from sinner, or we are either a sinner or we are a child of the Most High. So what he's talking about is an identity issue. Even sinners do that. And yet he says, when you do this, you will become children of the Most High. This is very important. We aren't both sinner and a child of the Most High. Well, so there might be some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but, but we're sinners saved by grace. We're all sinners, right? Scripture says we all have sinned. What happens is we wrestle with this quite honestly because we try to figure out a way to explain our sin. And it's difficult, right? If I'm a, if I'm a child of the Most High, then how do I explain my sin? We might think, well, we're just being humble by, you know, by saying we're sinners saved by grace. But if we understand who we are, then we have no excuse for sin. But if we say, ah, we're sinners saved by grace, now what we've done is, is we've said, yeah, well, you know, we're all sinners. But it's almost like an excuse for living the way we live. But if we recognize who we are as a child of the King, that we are a child of the Most High, all of a sudden we have to deal with sin differently. We don't have an excuse for it. What happens is, is that we have this tendency to believe that what we've done determines who we are. Okay, But what we have done doesn't make us who we are. For example, when I was in college, my first year in college, it uh, um, wasn't a great year. Um, in fact, I failed a class, and uh, it was the first time I'd ever failed a class. And it was devastating to me. I would, I would love to say, say that, oh, I was just, I'm resilient and it was not an issue, but it was. I had never done that before. And what happened was, I kind of went into a little bit of a spiral. Because what I began to think is, I was a failure. Some of you understand that, right? When we fail, we buy into this lie somewhere inside of us is, being, is telling us you're a failure. See, it turns from failing to becoming who you are. And I struggled with that. It took me 
quite a while to kind of recover. Yep, I failed a class. Not okay. I don't want to do that again, but it didn't make, didn't make me a failure, and yet I kind of bought into the idea I'm a failure. We do the same thing. We are children of God. And then when we say we sin, that makes us sinners, it's an identity then. And we have to, we have to allow ourselves to address that issue. So let's bring that picture into our relationship with Jesus, okay? See, Jesus' plan for us is salvation. And we throw that word around, and I don't know that we really understand what he's getting at. Jesus' plan for us is to be saved. Now, we use it as a term of something that took place already, and we move, we're moving past it, but, but I think... I really do believe we need to recognize salvation is an ongoing thing that that God is doing. Yep, it had a starting point, but it doesn't mean it it a flash in the pan. It doesn't mean it's this instantaneous moment that 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 starts and stops. Forgiveness, absolutely. We are forgiven. But salvation, we get the word salvation from the word, same, same root word, we get salve. What, what does a salve do? You put it on a wound, you put it on some kind of you know, uh, injury, and it heals. But it doesn't heal immediately. It helps the healing process. If we can maybe look at what Jesus is doing as sal- salving, forgiveness is wiping the slate clean. Salvation is a process of healing, of transforming. See, Jesus' death on the cross offers us forgiveness, but what His plan for us is, is saving us. See, we are being saved. Now, some translations don't word it this way, but I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Because the NIV, I really believe, handled this word well. He says, they, they say this. It's in Paul's writings. And Paul writes the Corinthians. He says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I would like this to recognize that what, if we can put the word sinners in there, for those who are sinners, using the term from Jesus' from Jesus's passage, okay? For those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do you hear that, that movement, that moving forward? Perishing is like moving backwards, being saved is moving forward. It is the power of God. The message of the cross isn't just about, and I hate to say the word just, isn't just simply forgiveness. It's forgiveness and being saved. For thus, those of us who are being saved, we are becoming children of the Most High. So, th- so therefore, understand there's an identity thing here that Jesus is talking to us about his disciples are becoming children of the most high which brings me to point number three Jesus says this that God is God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked What I find is really interesting is is he places that statement in an interesting place. See, the statement is found um, in verse 36, I believe. But look at verse 35 and 36. It says this. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will become children, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So he says, listen, he says this. 
love, do good, lend. He speaks about reward. And then he pulls it back and he says, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. John wants us to see something here. Okay, that, that statement is a, where it fits especially. Is he, he just gets done talking about the reward. And then he says, because he's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Jesus doesn't say in, in this passage, in John's translation of it, in his storytelling, he doesn't say that he is kind to the wicked and the righteous. That would have made sense, right? He says the ungrateful and the wicked. He doesn't say the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the heathen and the holy. John is, is wanting us to see something here. Now, I've said before that the Sermon on the Mount and, and Jesus' message here and the Sermon on the Plain, they may have been the same sermon, but it's possible they were different sermons, different, spoken at different times. But there's a lot of similarities. But, but Matthew tells it us that Jesus said he causes, it's Matthew 5, 45, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, that makes sense. The, the evil and the good, the righteous and the unrighteous. Yeah, it's the good and the bad. But John wants us to see the ungrateful and the wicked. See, I read that at first glance and I'm thinking, oh, well, that's the bad and the bad, right? I mean, the ungrateful and the wicked. Is it possible what Jesus is wanting us to see is that when we struggle to re return good for evil, when we only love those who love us, when we give expecting to get back and get in return, when we are, then we are ungrateful. What makes us ungrateful? So we can't do what he is calling us to. See, the less that we can see how much we are loved, the less that we can see how good God is to us, the less that we can see how generous God is to us, the more apt we are to base our behavior, to evaluate our behavior on what even sinners do. And we think we're okay. The more apt we are to treat our enemies or others in the way even sinners do. Gratitude can help transform our response. Maybe that's part of our problem. As we look at this story, is it possible that the reason it feels impossible to us, the reason it seems overwhelming, the reason we have these emotions of, oh, I don't want to enable anybody and I don't want to take, be taken advantage of and, and I don't want to just let somebody get away with it is because we don't recognize what we've been shown. That, is it possible that we're ungrateful? Okay, so those are the things that we kind of looked at to take note of. And, and I don't know about you, but there's a part of me that's like, oh, that's m way more than I needed this morning. And, and so, but I want us to just could put that lens on again of Christ being formed in me. Christ being formed in you. What does that mean? As he becomes more and more, and as I kind of die to that old self, as I think about the picture that Jesus painted of God, I look, I look with expectation of Christ being formed in me. As I look at this story and I think about Christ being formed in me, the question comes to my mind. In what ways will we see Christ show himself in us? I mean, if we grasp what Jesus is saying here, I truly believe there will be an emotion in us that, that wrestles with his words. These are difficult. When we see people on the news looting, we see the rioters, we see the protesters, 
Maybe when you're just driving maybe through Spokane and you see those guys on the street corner asking for money. When we have those people in our lives that, are, that, that we, we'd say, oh, they kind of walk all over us. When we have those situations that we feel like we're being taken advantage of. When we have that response of, this is getting old. And if you can think of those situations, then you can identify with God more than you realize. The difference is, God doesn't respond the way we do. And that is where we need Christ to be formed in us. I mean, do you realize how impossible this teaching is to follow if there isn't something inside of us propelling us to live this way? Now, let me caution you, all right? It would be really easy to see this, what we've just read, as a list to follow. Okay, well, I'm supposed to love my enemies. I'm supposed to do good to those who hate me. I'm supposed to bless those who curse me. I'm supposed to pray for those who mistreat me. Instead, will you see this as Jesus using these examples to expand our understanding of how he desires his disciples to live toward others? He's just painted us a picture of what he wants it to look like. Think of the picture that he just painted. What does that look like to you? Uh, At first thought, part of me feels like, well, being walked all over feels like I'm being weak. Taken advantage of. It kind of feels like I'm the victim. And if that's where you think, if that's what you think it is, then you need to let this picture soak in. See, as I look at the life of Jesus and I imagine what he went through, at no point in time do I look at Jesus as weak. I mean, to have endured what he endured There was not a weakness in him. I think about the time at the end when he was arrested and and the, the high council is questioning him and they end up slapping him, spitting on him. He didn't defend himself. He stood there. He was flogged. He carried his own cross to the hill. And on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. I don't see anywhere in there where he was weak. He could have stopped it at any time, and he didn't. That is incredible strength. What he's calling us to here is something we need strength to carry out. It is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. See, love for love is justice, okay? I mean, that makes sense, right? If you return love for love, that's, that's a just thing. But love for no love, well, that is, that's favor and kindness, Okay? But love, generosity, mercy, compassion to everyone, including those who haven't earned it and those who have swung so far the other direction, this is a quality of God and one in which God will reward one day. That hopefully changes our picture a little. Luke said, Jesus' words, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. We want to compare that to what Matthew says. Matthew says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
So do you think they say the same, Jesus is saying the same thing here? Don't say that they're not saying the same thing. Okay? Let me warn you. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is a, a similarity. There is, it, it is the same thing. See, love, generosity, mercy, and compassion, this is what we are called to. These are the character traits of God. This is what we are to be, to be perfect. That we love God with all of our soul, heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we love our neighbor as ourself. That is perfection. Perfection. That is what we des- that he desires from us, and that is what he means to have Jesus formed in us. See, this is not a list for us to accomplish. It's not a picture of love that Jesus wants to paint within us to anybody who is listening. See, you're in contact with with these situations constantly. We think worst-case scenario stuff, right? Those times when when somebody has taken extreme advantage of us. But we are in contact with these situations constantly. We kind of brush them off sometimes. We, we, We just respond, we respond like the rest of the world responds, and we think it's okay, and we don't think it, we don't give it a whole lot of thought. If we aren't listening we will continue to react the way we have always reacted. We will keep thinking of the effects of their behavior on us. We will respond by protecting our kingdom. We will become defensive and angry and bitter. But remember, we are becoming children of the Most High. And we belong to his kingdom. See, when we can get that picture, when we can grab a hold of that, the way that the, the, the situations that, that Jesus is talking about here look different. Everything we have is his. You're taking something from me? Well, it's not really mine anyway. Do we trust that God can handle these things? The things we have are just on loan from Him. This is not our home. Whatever they take from us, it's only temporary. I can say that very easily. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that my first response isn't going to be defend my, my stuff. But recognize what he is calling us to. See, your salvation, your healing, your transformation is of primary concern. And for us who are his disciples, this will give you a platform to disciple others. Because if we live the way Jesus calls us to, people will look to us and want to know what we have. But if we live the way sinners live and we respond the way sinners live, we're discipling others to continue on with the world's pattern. If we live the way God's calling us to here, people will be drawn to Christ in us. Let's not buy into that, even even the sinners do. Let's recognize what Jesus is pointing out to us. Let's be grateful. And through that gratitude, let's love our enemies. Let's do good to those who hate us. Let's bless those who curse us. Let's pray for those who mistreat us. Let's turn the other cheek. Let's do to others as we would want them to do to us. Would you pray with me, please?
Father, I thank you so much for um, your word, even though uh, this is it's, it's challenging, and, it, and for me, as I, as I think about it, it's, it's actually kind of scary. Because as I let it sink in, I think, well, so where am I going to experience this next, this week, that this is going to be put to the test? Lord, I want us to be in that group that can say, but to you who are listening, ah, that's me. I get it. Would you transform us so that we can love and do good, we can pray for, and we can respond the way you did. We need your strength to live like you call us to live. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Let, that, let his words sink in, please. All right?